So this morning, our God moment is Catherine Gonzalez, and she's a repeat customer, which we love, <laughs> um, because it comes from her heart, and we just love that. We're so grateful for that. So let's pray. Oh, Father heaven, in heaven, we just ask for your blessings on Catherine. We just say thank you for bringing her to us and for her willingness to share from her heart. In your name we pray, amen. I hope after all that y'all can hear me. Yeah? Okay, great. I'd just like to start with a prayer. Dear Lord, please accept this talk on patience and forgiveness to be a blessing to people here and to be, give all the glory to you. Amen. So I gave you the topic, it's on patience <laughs> and forgiveness. So when we were reading uh, Charles Stanley's wonderful book and studying it, and I'll read from Galatians. Oh, I stapled these in the wrong order. There's only two. Okay, all right. It's Galatians 5.22, as we remember, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And patience is what jumped out at me because I have struggled with that for so long. And when I became a Christian about 25 years ago, that was one of my first prayers, just to pray for patience. I was a single mom and busy, busy and running around and had two teenagers and God was putting me in the longest lines possible at the grocery store, at the ATM, tickets to buy, whatever it was, and my teenage daughter would say, you know, I'm not praying for patience. I don't know why I have to suffer along with you, you know, teenage girls. Uh, but when I would lose patience, I'd also feel like I was losing self-control, and that, you know, it all just kind of spiraled downward. And um, but let me kind of give you an example of how God's worked in my life in this area of patience. So I lived in a townhouse and uh, I had gone home for lunch from work and I got tied up, whatever, reading something probably, and it was very late. I was backing out of my garage and you know how townhouses have garages that face each other with a kind of an alley, okay. Well, there was a lady about three uh, garages ahead of me backing out, and when I say backing out, I mean, I could have crawled faster. It was an inch at a time out. And I'm always in a hurry, and I have no patience. And I thought, okay, this is, this is the moment. And I'm waiting and waiting for just, I couldn't get around her. And finally, I couldn't stand it, and so I honked which of course had the opposite effect because she stopped. <laughs> and I lo she looked in the river and went, go, go already, you know? And she came to the street and there was somebody doing some yard work, so she stopped and looked and, go, just turn, turn already. And then there were speed bumps. Um, <laughs> she had to stop. And I knew this was God working on me, and I was failing miserably. And I just had no control. I honked at her a third time. Go, and when she came to Winrock, I said, please turn left. Please, she turned right. And we got to the light, and she was right next to me. She was turning left, I was turning right. Thank God she was turning left. And I wouldn't look at her. I just turned my head like this. And about halfway to work, I realized you have lost your mind. Your heart is pounding. Your hands are clenched. It, you're sweating. You know you've done wrong, and now you're going to have to apologize, and I hate that. <laughs> and, you know, you, you failed before God, and he's trying to help you, you know. And I... What did it cost me? Five minutes? 10 minutes? You know? But in the moment, I'm not rational. You know, I just, I lost control. So, I know I have to, 
I repent to God and ask for his forgiveness, but I also know I need to apologize. So I'm waiting and watching for her. And I'm backing out to come to church, come to St. Martin's. And she's pulling in, thank you God, she was not pulling in. So I let her see my hands so she knew I wasn't completely nuts. And, but you know what, I had this devil on my shoulder and he said, you don't have to do this now. You're gonna be late, I'd like to be late. You're gonna be late for church. And I said, he said, you could do it later. I said, no, no, I'm doing it right now. So I walked over to her and she had turned the car off and just rolled the window down. She didn't get out. <laughs> and um, I, so I just had to put my hands kind of on her you know, door and lean in. I've never seen her face to, to this day. And I said, you know, I, I'm here to apologize for my behavior, and I don't know what I said, you know. I was crazy, and, and I didn't get very far, and she just breathed a sigh of relief, and she put her hands on mine, and she said, you are so sweet to come over and say this to me. She said, I have felt so badly about that day, because she said, I'm a 73-year-old woman, and I have no business shooting the finger at anybody. <laughs> And I said, well, you know, I didn't see it. I didn't. It had to be at the stoplight, you know, when I, and I said, but if I had, I mean, it was completely appropriate, really. And she and I laughed and giggled and we, we were both just blessed. And I left for church feeling restored, redeemed. <laughs> You know, light as a feather. But that was God's gift. If I hadn't had that faith that he would forgive me and know the path, you know, that I needed to take. And it would have not only hurt me, it would have hurt her, right? You know, I hadn't really thought about that. Well, then God sent my, my wonderful husband, who was very patient and very tolerant. And his word for me was calamante. I know I'm not saying it right, John, but it's calm, calm yourself. And I would just take a deep breath. And he, he, he has taught me a lot, I've learned a lot from him. And then God, with his infinite sense of humor, and me still praying for patience, sent me to Mexico, the land of Manana, <laughs> for 13 years. And if you can't learn patience in Mexico, you can't stay there. Because you know, manana doesn't mean tomorrow. Manana means not today. You don't know when. It could be uh, any time. So we were there for 13 years, as I said. And I, I did, I feel like I got better at patience. But getting, getting cancer really stopped me. I, I live in the moment. And that has been a huge gift. And while I have cancer, I don't feel like I have cancer. I feel great. People always say, well, you look great. I go, well, that's what matters, I guess. You know, <laughs> you try to do your best, but I have learned patience, finally. Praise God. I'm probably not perfect, especially in traffic. <laughs> but, but I have learned to live in the moment. So... I'll stop with, I continue praying for patience, but I know I can repent and receive God's forgiveness. And from Psalm 32, <clears throat> excuse me, I confess, my trans I confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Thank you, God.
Wow, class dismissed. That was, no, no. That was wonderful. Oh my goodness, Catherine, what a gift you are. What a gift you are. Let me get my papers together here. Good morning, good to see you. So glad you're here. Catherine and I have something in common besides being impatient by nature, but no. Um, she has four sisters and a brother, and so do I. Does anybody else have four sisters and a brother in this? Really? That's amazing. Oh my goodness, that's great. Good, okay. Um, Welcome. Welcome to this fine study. Welcome to Zoom groups. Um, if you are new, come say hello after class. I'd love to meet you. This class was started by Janie Putman almost 30 years ago, and we are honored to continue it. My name is Anna McLean. Most of us have found this fellowship life-changing. Our focus is simple, God's word and prayer the essential building blocks to a meaningful life, and not just a meaningful life, but a changed life, where God guides our thoughts, our words, and actions. So climb aboard this love train. It's very exciting. When the word of God, which is living and active, Hebrews 4.12 tells us, becomes as relevant to you today as it was for its original audience. Be ready for the life-changing truth of Colossians. It will cut away all the excess baggage you may be carrying. And I loved Greta's photo last week of the overstuffed bag. Um, it is easy for we Christians to add things onto the simple truth of the gospel. Well, Colossians will give us a laser focus on the truth. So refreshing in our cluttered environment. These photos are of Christ's missionaries um, sharing him, uh, family sharing him in El Salvador. That's a St. Martin's uh, family mission trip. And we have the QR code that you can um, use on our slide to support them um, with uh, things that they need for El Salvador. But there are also some CLS leaders in there. Can you, any of you see yourselves? Yeah, you're pretty beautiful. Okay, let's begin with prayer. Loving God, you make your word come alive to us. Speak to us today. Give us open and patient hearts to hear your voice. Thank you for our time together. We ask all of this in your holy name. Amen. I did like the intro to this study. Um, it asks, why study the Bible? Well, Several good reasons. We get to know God through his word. We see his goodness, his love, his mercy. And God speaks to us from his word. And there will be times when your heart, you will know that he is speaking directly to you with some of these verses. God's word bring life, brings life. He alone, God, knows how our life is meant to work that love makes us happier than hate, that generosity brings more joy than greed, that integrity allows us to sleep better than deception. God's word offers stability in an unstable world. God's word, like himself, never changes. God's word helps us pray effectively. We've learned so much about prayer, and we'll talk about that today. We've learned that God answers prayer according to his will and that we discover his will by reading the Bible. Think about the best book you've ever read. Think about it. I don't know. War and Peace. Anybody read War and Peace? <laughs> A few of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Kathy. Um, but can it even come close to this book, this, to all of these claims? I don't think so. I take it you notice that our lessons don't have just four questions, <laughs> but 15 to 20. Um, 
Somebody, some of you may have done community Bible study before. Anybody? Did? I actually did it like 35 years ago in Dallas. Um, it was my very first Bible study. It was really exciting. Um, but some helpful suggestions with this study. Again, we just want you to come and share. But I, I do um, think these suggestions are good. So a quick run through. Um, try to do your lesson over several days. Perhaps you could start on Monday and do a section or two each day. But it gives you time to really think about this scripture. And this is scripture you want to know. Read the whole passage of scripture covered in the lesson. This gives you context for the whole lesson. Reading the Bible in context helps you interpret it accurately. We want that, ladies. This week, we had 14 verses. Write out the memory verse on a sticky note and memorize it. You will be amazed how memorized scripture comes to you when you need it in your busy life. Read the scripture for each section and answer the questions. Without a commentary or reference materials, God wants to know what you think. There is great joy in having the Holy Spirit teach you God's word on your own. We've learned that this fall, haven't we? The apply what you've learned section is good. The key is not just learning this, but being changed by it. Well, this week's Apply What You've Learned section was so helpful to me. It really made me think, how do I pray? Then read the commentary section. Um, That's why it's after the questions. This is written by one theologian to help you understand the context. It's very good, but it's just one person's understanding of the material. And then finally, the Think About It section. Do this. Pause and consider what you've learned and personalize it. Colossians is worth all the time you have. Bishop Claude Payne used to say, have you ever regretted a dollar that you gave away? He was a master fundraiser. Well, I will say this, have you ever regretted an hour that you've spent with God's word? Thank you, Greta, for your excellent introduction of Colossians. As she said, the author was Paul. Saul of Tarsus. There is some debate about when he wrote it, but we know he wrote it from prison, either in Rome, Ephesus, or Caesarea. He was in a lot of prisons. Half of his ministry he spent in prison. The church at Colossae was not founded by Paul, although he probably passed through there on his second missionary journey. And this map... um, is needed, shows you some very cool roads that were instrumental. It doesn't show his missionary journey, but um, it's it's kind of important. Uh, Paul set up camp in Ephesus, if you can see, for two years. And his ministry was so effective that people from all over Asia Minor would come to hear him teach about Jesus. And they would take it back to their towns and start churches. I didn't realize that. Epaphras was such a person. Acts 19.10 tells us that all the Greeks and the Jews who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Think about that miracle. Very exciting what one man could do. Epaphras has sought out Paul wherever he is in prison because there are problems. Thinking of, um, but think about the faithfulness of this man, whether he walked 100 miles to find him in Ephesus or 1,200 miles to get to Rome, traveling so far to seek the truth and take it back to his flock. Because Colossian believers are starting to mix in Jewish mysticism and local folk beliefs with their worship to give them a fuller experience. Just a few facts, because I like them. Colossae was the smallest of three cities in the Lycus Valley. Laodicea and Heropolis were the other two. You can see them. All three towns had a Christian community. They were 100 miles east of the bustling, prosperous port city of Ephesus. But Colossae was known for its purple wool called Colossinus. And when the roads change, and you can see the red line, but 
the old road, I think, was the blue line. But when the roads changed and went through Laodicea, Colossae's fortunes collapsed and declined. And finally, in the 12th century, the Turks destroyed Colossae and left it in ruins. Well, in 1835, W.J. Hamilton identified and explored the ruins of the city and its citadel. He observed many marble columns, a ruined theater, and a cemetery with rock-cut graves. But archaeological discoveries in the city have been limited to have had, were really kind of small, but they found some coins and an ancient church. Proof of Paul and Epaphras' hard work. It's always so cool when the archaeology confirms the Bible. The coins, though, that they found, the few that they found, demonstrated a wide range of ancient deities, both Roman and Egyptian, that were worshipped there. So, we have this community of Colossians in Coloss of Christians in Colossae with all kinds of noisy outside influences. And a community, too, with declining fortunes and dissatisfaction, leading them to seek man-made solutions. Feel free to open your Bible to Colossians. Um, we see that Paul's letter begins with a greeting and a prayer. This greeting is so much more than hello, isn't it? It gets the reader's attention in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Paul says, I've been sent by Jesus to give you these words. Paul is sharing God's thoughts for Colossae, not just his. And he says to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, verse 2, what a generous and affirming beginning, recognizing that this community belongs to Christ. And to say faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, did you notice that? This is amazing, really. No other religions appreciated or recognized the worth of women believers. Only Jesus does. And we will see, in, like we will see in the Luke scripture and our later questions, um, we might be uncomfortable at the thought of believers being called holy, but N.T. Wright says this, to be holy in our conduct is to employ Christ's love in whatever situation we find ourselves. So simple, isn't it? And so takes the spotlight off of ourselves. He finally finishes his greeting with grace. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Ah, the gift of these few words. So from the get-go, we are reminded what God the Father has done. The definition of God's grace in my Bible dictionary is unmerited favor. It's available to the sinner for salvation and available to the redeemed for victorious living. I like that, both parts of grace. So we receive God's grace when we confess our belief in Jesus, his son, not receiving the death that we deserve for our sins, but we also receive this continual grace daily, knowing that we are forgiven and we can love and live without guilt. So a phenomenal greeting to make these believers ready, receptive to his teaching. And I wonder, do we teach this way wouldn't our audience absorb so much more if we began by reminding them who they are and what God has already done for them? Paul is constantly praying for this church. Um, that was such a beautiful thing to see in the few small verses we had. How would it encourage our loved ones if they knew we were constantly praying for them? Not a bad thing to share with them. When I see my little ones in Dallas, I tell them, I have missed you every day since I've seen you. Well, I need to start saying, I am praying for you every day. Um, we learn the mark of a group of believers is simple. Faith in Jesus Christ and love for one another. And Colossae has this. It has faith in Jesus Christ and love for one another. Notice that Paul doesn't say, 
you have faith in Christ Jesus and you know scripture really well or you have faith in Christ Jesus and you're a lot more moral than you used to. That's, no, he doesn't say that. He says, you have faith in Jesus Christ and your love for others shows, it shines. N.T. Wright again says, you know, this love doesn't simply mean we all have good feelings about one another. They may or they may not have good feelings. What matters, though, is the behavior that marks out so much of the world, the lust, the anger, the lies, and so on, which split up families and communities, is being replaced by kindness, gentleness, forgiveness, acceptance of one another, despite the differences of race and culture. The Colossian community is bearing fruit and more and more are coming to Christianity because of it. So wherever there is just two things, faith in Christ Jesus and love for one another, the kingdom of God will grow. And now Paul prays for them, and wow, what a prayer. Paul cannot be with these Christians in person, but he can pray, and it's a mighty one. A mighty one that we might want to adapt when praying for our loved ones. I was really convicted in that lesson section, apply with you, what you've learned. It asked, how does Paul's prayer compare to your, the prayers you pray for those you love? Wow, I just want my Dallas family to move to Houston. I mean, <laughs> that's it. That's just my prayer. Um, Susan Finnegan's got the same prayer. Um, But John Corson, in his commentary, tells us this. Notice how Paul prays for things we don't even think about. But these are the important issues. These are the issues of eternity. What does Paul pray? First, that they are filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. To know God's will and to be filled, filled spiritually. Well, Charles Stanley, in our awesome study, this is a lesson 11. Go back to it on spiritual discernment. It's worth reviewing. To be spiritually discerning is so much more than being smarter. Remember that. We want our kids to be smart and successful and all that. Nah, we want spiritual discernment. We are to ask for it. Charles Stanley told us to seek it to accept it, to submit to it, to study God's word along with this prayer and to obey him. Spiritual fullness, I love this, um, is defined as the satisfaction of our deepest needs. And it's what David is talking about in Psalm 23, 5. Lord, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. You fulfill every need, Lord. That's a beautiful part of Psalm 23. Christian teachers can talk until they're blue in the face, but until their hearers have this inner sense of wisdom and understanding, this awareness of the true God who loves them and shapes their lives in a new way, it won't produce disciples. Point two, to lead lives worthy of the Lord, being fruitful in every good work as they grow in knowledge of God. This is believers choosing the new life that God has for them, to not be enslaved by the old habits in the flesh, walking around defeated and condemned, but freed by the life led by the Spirit. Romans 6, 4, 8, 1, and 8, 4 are the references here. They're wonderful. Point three, to endure patiently with the strength that God provides. Such an important part of this prayer. Yes, to be long-suffering. It is not our favorite fruit of the Spirit, is it? Does anyone like long-suffering? No. You know, we... (sighs) This is a beautiful verse, Ecclesiastes 7, 8. I've never read it before. Maybe some of you know it, but wow. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. The patient in spirit 
are better than the proud in spirit. That's a gem. Point four, to joyfully give thanks to this Father who loves us and has enabled us to share in in eternity with him. Way back in the beginning, way in the Old Testament, when God was forming these people, this chosen people, not because they were better or whatever, but because he chose them, in the beginning he said, be thankful. Psalm 104, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him. Bless his name. In this short letter, Paul gives us three powerful verses on thankfulness. This tells me it's pretty important to God. Our verse 12, verse 2, 7, and 3, 15. Thankfulness is described as the energy source of discipleship. So, a four-point prayer that seems to cover all need and goals for a loved one. I hope that question number 15 um, did not catch you off guard. Um, You know the answer. What qualifies a person for an inheritance in God's kingdom? The acceptance of Jesus Christ as her Savior. You know, the God I know and love invites all to this relationship. All can choose this eternal life with him. Our memory verse, rescued from the power of darkness. Paul doesn't want these young believers ever to forget where they came from. The despair, the futility, the depravity, the evil. I don't know about you, but I never want to go back there. Have you been to Methodist Hospital lately? Isn't this sculpture in the foyer powerful? I, I didn't get the artist, but it's larger than life. It's called Jesus, the Great Physician. And it reminded me of our Luke passage this week of the woman seeking Jesus in the house of the terrifying Pharisees. That woman sought Jesus, and he found her. And just for a second, close your eyes and see yourself as that woman that he is reaching out to touch. See yourself being healed and found by Jesus. All right, these are my steps in the spirit this week. I, (laughs) your real step is I encourage you to amplify your prayers for loved ones with this mighty prayer. Um, Work these four points in and it'll be very exciting to see the results of this prayer. Um, I've been with my grandchildren in Dallas. One is age six, James, and the other one is four, going on 21. (laughs) They are about to have a new sister the end of this month. It looks like my daughter-in-law is having a basketball (laughs) instead of a baby. She is so uncomfortable. So I told her, I said, just let me do everything. I'll do carpool, I'll do grocery, I'll do cooking, you name it. A full cardio workout for sure. I'm still so tired. (laughs) But don't be too impressed because I already, I locked her cars and her key at one point. She had to Uber with an extra set. Um, So I'm not sure how helpful I was, but I tried. Um, But this is James in a tree. He has a climbing tree in his front yard, which is really a gift. Um, And he'll say, can I get up in that tree? I'll say, you bet, but don't break your arm (laughs) on my watch. No, but this is Mazden um, in her PJ. She changes clothes every hour. So this is three in the afternoon and she's in her PJs, riding scooters and swinging. And then this is uh, ice cream with Marmee. They picked out the most colorful, god-awful flavor. I said, what does it taste like? And they're like, we don't know, it's good. But anyway, the almost four-year-old Mazden is at that stage where you put her down for bed and in no time she's right there in front of you. And then you put her down again and you pray and you, you know, read books again and then by golly, there she is. But finally, finally, the first night she crept out of her room and stood before me and she said, Marmy, will you love me no matter what? 
I said, yes, I will love you no matter what. But later on, I laughed and thought, what did you just do? Why, why did you say that? <laughs> will you love me no matter what? Like, what, where was that coming from? Oh, man, she is something. She's precocious. But her brother, James, a six-year-old, is so interested in animals, um, especially sea animals. We just talked about them all the time and who eats who in the food chain, <laughs> which makes me think he's thinking about the pecking order in his new family arrangement or something. Who's the predator and who's the prey? So he would give me an animal and he'd say what that animal eats and then who eats that animal. I said... Wow, and so I said, um, he said, well, Marmy, the good fact about the sperm whale is that it eats squids and sharks, but the sad fact about the sperm whale is that it can be eaten by orca whales. Well, I've been laughing about James saying the sad fact, you know, a six-year-old saying the sad facts. <laughs> but yes, James, there are good facts and there are sad facts, right? The sad fact is we're all sinners and we deserve death, but the good fact is that Jesus has come. He lives, and if we choose him, we live. So Colossians is just the facts about Jesus, and that is enough. So a greeting, a beautiful greeting that affirms who they are in Christ, and then a prayer that encourages them to be more in Christ. Um, let's pray. Oh, Lord God, thank you, thank you, thank you for this rescue of us, this inheritance, this kingdom in which we belong. Encourage our prayer life with this model prayer. Your grace and peace carry us throughout the day. Help us bear fruit with those around us. We ask all this in your awesome name. Amen.